Hi, my name is Jens Gonson, Vice President of Jensen Hughes. And I'm Mark Susky, Technical Fellow at Jensen Hughes, and we want to welcome you to our podcast series on the performance-based design solutions for lithium-ion battery hazards. To kick off this series, we're going to start with an overview of battery science, potential hazards, and current codes and standards. Let's just like briefly review what a lithium ion battery cell is, right? The battery cell is a basic functional electrochemical unit. You now a battery can be different things, but in lithium ion space, we talked about electrochemical. You know, we have like an anode on the left, the cathode on the right, separator in the middle, we got a flammable electrolyte in the middle, floating around and the uh, ions are hopping from left and right depending if they're like being charged or discharged. A cell can have different form factors. You know, most popular ones are like a pouch cell, for example, SK or LG, or cylindrical cells like Tesla or Panasonic, or we have prismatic cells, which is like often Samsung or CATL in the automotive space, right? There are different chemistries. Most popular, I would say, in automotive are like the uh, nickel manganese cobalt, you know, that's an LG thing, or like NCA, likewise LFP, lithium iron phosphate. Um, what's important to note, since this is also a fire safety talk, is that these chemistries that there's no in these cells, there's no lithium metal, so it's not water reactive. So if we're dealing with battery fires, it's okay to put water on it, right? Otherwise, we're always thinking like, oh, lithium, no, don't put water on it, you know, but that was the case for a lithium battery, a primary battery, but not for a secondary lithium ion battery, right? So when we take a look at the separator, what we then worry about if that separator degrades for some reason or breaks down, right? Because now we have like a mixing of the stuff on the left and the stuff on the right. We have a short circuit in the cell. We have like some unintended chemistry going on and that leads to a reaction. That re reaction gets more intense with the state of charge of the battery, but in most cases it'll lead then to a so-called thermal runaway uh, condition. So a thermal runaway is an exothermic uh, chemical reaction. If we, you know, um, remember that from our like high school and university days, unless you're a chemist and you deal with it every day, right, it's a very accelerating um, reaction in which uh, the typical consequence is that the cell will, will rupture, burst open, and, and release uh, fairly large amounts of, of flammable gas, okay? Um, in some cases, depending on the chemistry and again on the state of charge, that release of gas might catch fire. So, um, so we, we can have um, burning reactions or like venting reactions with the thermal runaway. Um, what causes it? is a short circuit, as I mentioned earlier, but uh, what, causes the what causes the short circuit? And that's typically, we distinguish four main things. One is, it's just like a manufacturing defect. Second one is an overcharge condition. We're gonna have like charge discharging operations to test the cell. That is where stuff can happen, in particular when we overcharge or when we overheat. And the last one, is a mechanical uh, abuse situation um, where like, you know, the cell was dropped or something like that, you know? Um, so now we have the hazard identified. Let's quantify it a little bit further to underline the scale or the magnitude of what the problem could be, okay? So as I mentioned, the, the gas that comes out of the cell is flammable. So what is it comprised of, you know? It is basically a dirty cocktail. It's a dirty mix of stuff. Um, we call it battery gas for the lack of better terms. Um, and it's primarily carbon dioxide, carbon monoxide, uh, hydrogen, and uh, hydrocarbons. Sometimes you might have 20% hydrogen, sometimes you might have 35 and so on, but roughly a third is typically hydrogen. It varies with, um, based on, on different factors, okay? Um, in addition to uh, flammability components, we also may have toxic components like uh, uh, hydrofluoric gas or HCN, you know, so we are worried about worker safety, first responder safety when there's a battery fire, right? Um, and here's like a fun exercise, uh, just like to give us uh, some understanding of like, 
okay, how much gas, what are we worried about, right? Referencing a dissertation from a re recent uh, PhD student. He performed 21 different tests and captured that data. Um, a rise in Sweden actually came out with a new paper just last month with a much larger series of tests. Um, but basically it means um, there's a mean value of 0 0.4 liters per watt hour. So, you know, what does that mean when we are having like an automotive pack, right? We have like at, at, at this point, a 10 kilowatt hour is like a small battery in an EV, right? We are going now like to 100 kilowatt hours, right? 10 kilowatt hours, if that would be fully consumed in a thermal runaway event, would be 4,000 liters of flammable gas, you know? So at a lower flammability limit of 10%, you know, you can do the math what that means that you could actually have an explosible concentration in a room, you know. So it's important that we protect uh, against uh, explosions in that scenario. So this is also important, of course, in storage arrangements, because once we are done with manufacturing the cells, they have been charged and discharged, they're going to go in large warehouses. And, um, you know, if we have a fire in a warehouse, that can be pretty devastating because the fire can, can uh, propagate from cubby to cubby in the storage arrangement. So the severity of that reaction then varies, you know, based on the, what's the energy density of the cell, how big is the cell. We're going now to really big cells, right? Pushing, let's say, 100 amp hour in one cell, right? Um, also, what's the construction material and what's the state of charge, right? Like a higher state of charge generally makes the whole thing more volatile. Now, when we are thinking about storing these cells, we want to make sure that everything is safe, right? And normally, we look at uh, fire safety codes and building codes that tell us what to do. And um, unfortunately, the codes and standard world has not really caught up yet in addressing that hazard, you know? For example, NFPA 13, which is like the code for, for designing a sprinkler system, tells you, do not use that code when you're st storing lithium ion batteries. It does not apply, right? So where do you get the technical basis from? Or where does the authority having jurisdiction, what do they want? What, what do they deem as safe, right? So there's a little bit of a gray area. And um, what people have started doing is because the, the energy storage industry seems to be a little ahead with that you know we have a standard like nfpa 855 which is like the installation guide for energy storage systems where we have like where we can have several hundreds of megawatts hours of stored batteries in an indoor arrangement so we can take a look at that likewise ul 9540 which is the listing standard for energy storage systems or 9540a which is like the thermal runaway testing standard for lithium ion cells you know these standards don't really directly apply to an automotive manufacturing environment, but AHJs have started to look at those and take the best lessons learned from them uh, and apply them to the manufacturing environment. You know, that's why we are pointing them out here and having listed them for you guys. There are like more codes and standards here um, that can be referenced and the best can be taken from them, but more work needs to be done. On the building side then, you know, we have now finally a chapter in the International Fire Code that does provide some language. It's a lot of language um, that is very similar from NFPA 855. It's a start, but it's not complete, you know. Earlier this year, FM Global actually updated their commodity classification data sheet, which is a really good step. Um, there we can get guidance on how to properly safely store lithium ion batteries. But again, more needs to be done. So that leaves the question, how do we properly protect, you know? And generally what we want to do is like, we want to monitor and prevent. If sensors monitor the condition and there is an alarm, we want to make sure that we alert and react, you know, we evacuate, get people out, get first responders in, suppress the fire and so on, and make sure, you know, we have a good, uh, good emergency response uh, and uh, in place and defined manual actions. But this general safety approach, if like codes and standards are not telling us how to do it properly, you know, we need to build our own technical basis. And, you know, we are proposing here today to you guys, you know, we can do that with a risk evaluation. 
and performance-based solutions. Thank you for joining us today. We will see you the next time.